Uh, my name is Ellen Satterwhite. I am so pleased to be um, moderating this panel because I am a super early streaming adopter. And I, as I was just telling Jashana, I have her app on my phone. I was an early Netflix adopter. Um, I am sort of the, uh, who were the major players in the streaming wars? So not necessarily the, um, and we can talk about whether streaming wars is appropriate. Not necessarily think is great. I'll subscribe to the service to watch it. Um, in any event, we're joined by this amazing panel, very interesting and different perspectives. Um, I'm really looking forward to learn today. So I will just say to those of you out there, this is like, this is your streaming 101. Um, I think there are a lot of words, you know, common vocabulary words that, that we all need to, to learn more about, but also where's the puck going? Um, and I think for a policy conversation and policy conversations in the next decade to be effective, we really need to talk more about where we're going than where we've been. So without further ado, let me introduce our panel. <clears throat> to my left, um, we have Kanan, who has 16 years of experience across corporate and investment banking. Um, he is with Barclays. He joined in September 2008 and is currently a director covering the U.S. media, cable, and satellite communication sectors. Directly next to him is Larry Downs. Um, Larry is a prolific author. Five books? Six? Five. Just five. What are you doing? What are you doing here? I'm taking a month off. Oh, okay. Um, his his latest book, uh, Pivot to the Future, has been nominated for the 2019 Thinkers 50 Strategy Award. I'm just kidding. They didn't win, but it was it's an honor. It's an honor to be nominated. Um, Larry is also a frequent speaker, congressional witness, and I hope you won't mind me saying sometimes a gadfly in this world uh, says the things that people are thinking but won't say out loud. So we're excited to have Larry. Um, next to Larry is Dishama, who is an established entrepreneur in the space. She's the founder of Quelly TV. Um, she's, she's also founded, she's been a publisher. Uh, she is a host and producer um, of a radio show and a dynamic creator. I'm very excited to have her on this panel. Um, and next to Deshana is Danny Ornstein. Um, Daniel has spent the past 15 years at the intersection of this space. He has held positions in government, um, with startups, with media companies, and he's the CEO of Bundler. So we'll have Danny tell us more about Bundler as his intro question. Um, so actually, Danny, can we start with you to talk about Bundler, because I sure. think that sets yes. is this, the stage. Yes, is this a good distance? I don't know. It's not a big room. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Danny Ornstein. Um, I, Ellen, Ellen and I actually worked together at the FCC uh, in the first Obama administration, and I raised that because I found, uh, well, one of the things that happens when you're, when you're uh, running a startup, uh, as Deshauna and I were just talking about, is you spend a lot of time pitching, just trying to summarize, explain what you do in different small, small, small ways. And I, the simplest way I have of doing it is it doesn't work with like California audiences, but it works well here, which is <laughs> um, it's my fastest way into Bundler, which is when I started at the FCC or in the transition process before we went through hundreds of binders of documents of old and ongoing proceedings. And I um, remember the day I started thinking about this when I was reading about Kevin Martin's a la carte. I, I don't even know if it was a proceeding back and forth. And there was this interesting kind of anecdote or um, that I'm sure I'm misremembering slightly of how uh, the agency economists kept coming back and saying, look, as soon as consumers pick 30 channels, it's more expensive than the bundle of 120 for various reasons. You know, it's just more efficient. It's actually a good model for consumers. And the chairman sent the agency economists back two or three times to <laughs> re redo an analysis, and they just couldn't make it work. And uh, I started thinking over the past, the, the next couple of years at the FCC, when I was then at a, a big media company at Warner Brothers, um, and, and as the OTT streaming services continued to launch and evolve, that we, are, we were heading towards a world of 
five, six, seven, eight, meg, we'll, we'll call them channels, right? But it's something like the HBO group of channels, the Comcast NBCU group of channels um, with direct to consumer subscription models at seven, eight, 12, $15, depending, that quickly will add up to a bigger cost than the uh, cable package. We also were focused on the fact that to this day, even with cord cutting, something like 80 or 90% of the people who subscribe to a bunch of streaming services, I think it's five plus, are also pay TV subscribers. And so those aren't so much the people cutting the cord. Um, so we are we are essentially building and launching soon, and we've launched some things along the way that I'm happy to talk about later. But um, essentially, a marketplace or aggregator for media subscription. So the best way to think of it, uh, and this actually probably will be work for this crowd too, is something like an MVPD that's instead of wholesale, you know, inflexible large bundles of channels. Uh, we bundle packages of existing, popular, standalone, direct-to-consumer services, and eventually that can include media, uh, other media subscriptions, news, audio, music, um, and in a place where users can manage this a la carte package, but also receive some discounts for subscribing to more and more services, something like the cable bundle. So. That's that's where we are, and we've been in the middle of this for four years. And uh, because we're a, a marketplace, we are working with, you know, we focus on what it, what is the best product or bundler or middleman um, for users for consumers. But we also make deals with content partners. So we've spent a lot of time kind of hearing about their plans and their priorities as they've been launching these new services. So I'm. Happy to kind of get into this conversation. Thank you. I'm as a, an ex FCCer, I really appreciate the the scene setting. Anytime we can talk about MVPDs, yeah. but I think some people in this audience okay. may be less familiar with the um, acronyms. So I'm going to turn Sorry. to Kanat. No, no, no. I, yeah. You set me up. I set you up to set me up. I see. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to you, uh, Kanan, because I think. And, and anyone feel free to jump in, but I think you probably do a lot of explaining about this this market to folks. So um, I wonder if you could set up who were the major players in the streaming wars. So not necessarily the, um, and we can talk about whether streaming wars is appropriate, not necessarily the companies themselves, but the what's OTT, what's SOVD, what are, what are um, aggregators versus channels versus... Um, the many acronyms we have out there. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, broadly, when you think about, I guess, the way we frame the whole discussion around streaming and uh, OTT is to look at it in terms of phases. So if you think about it, the first phase of this whole process was companies like Netflix, which, which took library content from television, just made it available online. That was phase one. It was all on-demand consumption, right? And the variable that Netflix brought into the picture was convenience. If you think about live TV, it is not very convenient in the sense that there is scheduled viewing. You have to be in front of a TV at a particular point in time to watch it. That's what Netflix solved for. It wasn't new content when they started. It was all old content, but you could watch it whenever you wanted and you could binge it, right? So that was the first phase of streaming in some ways, which was to just bring in convenience, right? Now, Amazon did this, Google did this, a lot of guys got into this game. Um, the second phase was virtual MVPDs. And this actually started uh, way before people realized because the first bundle or a skinny bundle or a small bundle that came into existence actually came from Comcast. And this was back in 2013. So it was a traditional cable company which created the first skinny bundle in some ways. And then, of course, you had Google launch this and Hulu launch this. So we now have smaller bundles, uh, which are streamed through the Internet. Now, if you think about the smaller bundles, they're not really solving any pain points for consumers. It's the same TV product we've always watched, but it's streamed through the Internet. It is still appointment viewing. It really doesn't solve that core issue, right? Um, and then you went into, uh, you know, a phase where people tried all kinds of permutations. So Hulu's doing both. They do a Netflix model, and they also give you the option to subscribe to a bundle. So you went to this hybrid phase 
Um, Google's doing a little bit of that as well with YouTube TV. Now, the phase that we are moving into uh, going forward um, is more ad-supported VOD. So if you think about it, you know, this year, we are going to see some of the biggest ad-supported streaming launches that we've seen. Um, right? And we haven't really seen that so far. So Comcast is launching Peacock, which is for the most part going to be ad-supported. You will have HBO launch HBO Max, which at some point in time is going to be ad-supported. Um, you have QB, which is a service being launched by Jeffrey Katzenberg, who used to be at Disney, and you know that's also going to be ad-supported. So when you think about the next phase, it's going to be free streaming, which is going to be ad-supported. So if you think about this evolution, what is interesting is it's the exact opposite <laughs> of the way pay TV world. Mm -hmm. In pay TV, we started with free broadcast, and we moved to premium TV where we pay, you know, $200. But here we are actually going from the premium end, which is Netflix, to free. Right? So in some ways, when you think about this evolution, <laughs> there is still a lot left to go in terms of the business models going forward. Mm -hmm. Right? But in terms of, you know, where we are, that's how we frame the discussion. Mm -hmm. Right? And we can dig deeper as we go into the conversation. That's great. And I, I love the... Um thinking about, forget everything you know about, and that's actually one of my questions later, forget everything you know about cable TV, except that that's not how this is going to go. Um, and so I, I want to ask you more in depth about what what lessons we can learn. I think Danny, you probably, um, and Larry have, have things to say about that. But I'd really like to turn to Deshana, because as I mentioned, I've seen her speak a couple of times about Quelly TV. Um, and I, I want you to share with the group what it is and sort of as I was telling her, I'm going to ask you um, to tell me who your favorite streaming character is or, or what you would be. And she was like, I don't have any time. I don't, I watch my, I watch my shows. I watch the stuff that I have to screen to get up. I, okay. She is a true entrepreneur. Um, so please tell us about, about Quelly. And um, also, you can download it on your phone right now while she's talking, by the way. Yes, actually, if you go to iOS or... No, I'm just joking. <laughs> actually, not joking. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll give the spiel first, and then I'll give you, give you time to download it. But um, good morning. My name is Deshana Spencer. I'm the founder of Quilly TV, spelled K-W-E-L-I-T-V. We allow people to celebrate Black stories from around the world through independent films, documentaries, web shows, children's programming, news, and recently events. So we have content from North America, parts of Africa, Europe, Latin America, the Caribbean, all in one place. For those who don't know, Quilly is actually a Swahili term. It means truth in Swahili. And so our whole purpose is to curate content that shows a true reflection of the global Black experience. And now you can go to your phones. <laughs> and uh, we have iOS app. We have an app on Google Play. We're on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire. I started Quilly TV with $20,000 and a dream because I really wanted to create um, a platform. You mentioned pain point. For me, Quilly TV was a pain point. I was looking for more independent films, more films that celebrated Black culture without some of the reality TV that I saw with Black women fighting each other or a lot of the gangster movies we saw uh, with Black men being shot and killed or selling drugs. And that didn't represent my family or how I grew up. And I wanted to see that in the media, I didn't see it, so I created a space to show that and to celebrate my culture. And that's how I started Quilly TV. That's great. And I'm serious, if you're downloading it, or you're not downloading it now, I will be checking phones as we leave. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so Larry, last but, but certainly not least for this first round, um, you have, have published some research on streaming and streaming audiences and, and sort of some of the misconceptions that we may have as um, people looking at it, but also as policymakers. I wonder if you'd talk a little bit about who, who are the streaming audiences okay. and, and what, do we, what have we gotten wrong? Okay. So, uh, so we're going to talk, so I have two hats. I'm going to wear my, my disruptive innovation hat now and we'll wear the policy hat uh, later. Um, so most of the work I do is around disruption of industry by emerging technologies. This is, you know, <laughs> this is ground zero um, in that sense. Uh, and it's a remarkable period. And, you know, if we don't say this 100 times, 
this really is a sort of, from a content standpoint, really a golden age for consumers. There's more content, more original content, more high quality, more specialized. I don't want to, I don't want to. Niche. I don't want to say niche, okay. but, right. you know, <laughs> yeah. more focused content um, uh, than, than you can co- possibly consume. Um, and the, the research that I published uh, late last year suggested that one of the things that um, investors and analysts are, are missing is they're trying to kind of find a trend line uh, as if this is all one big audience, mm. as this is one big demographic in particular. Uh, and what my research suggested instead was that there are at least three different demographic groups, all of whom are kind of um, embracing the new models and, and the new content, but in in somewhat different ways or in some cases in very different ways, mm-hmm. right? So we have, so, you know, and it, it kind of breaks down generally. So we have Generation X, that's me, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, we're, we're still largely subscribing to uh, linear TV or MVPD, MVPD, by the way, multi-channel video programming distribution. Very good. Um, Thank you very much. Gold star. Uh, and, and when we get to the policy discussion, we can start by saying why it's such a ridiculous term and that <laughs> only people in Washington use it and know it. That's a symptom of the bigger problem. Um, but, th- you know, they are embracing streaming services as well, but they're sticking with, they're sticking mm-hmm. with their traditional uh, pay TV, linear TV models. Then you've got the sort of the generation um, Xers, um, they're much more comfortable uh, with kind of building their own bundles, building their own uh, aggregations of what they like and what they don't like. And in particular, they don't really see as big a distinction as people my age might between traditionally produced, fully produced content and and I don't want to call it amateur because it's not amateur anymore, but in, in self-produced content. Mm-hmm. So YouTube. So, you know, they subscribe to YouTube channels. They don't mm-hmm. see those as necessarily all that, you know, it's obviously it's, you know, YouTube channels versus, say, you know, Game of Thrones. There's clearly a production uh, difference, uh, but they they see that as their as their viewing life. Mm-hmm. Then you've got the sort of you know youngest generations, the millennials and the, and the Gen Z folks. Um, they are unlikely to have ever had a linear TV bundle in the first place. They're unlikely to get one, mm-hmm. um, and so they're the ones who are really. Um, you know, most interested in playing with different streaming models that are coming and going, and it's, it can also, you know, it's like everything new is old again, <laughs> everything old is new again, going back to ad-supported. But I think what's most interesting about that demographic is they don't see as big a, so as, as the middle group doesn't see as a big distinction between a, a traditional production and self-production. This group doesn't see the big distinction between uh, production and own production, their, their own videos. So mm-hmm. I include in that group, you know, things that they do with Instagram and Snapchat uh, and with the gaming sites where they're, you know, watching people play video games and, and interacting with them. And, you know, really for them, video, and, you know, and de- definitely from a device standpoint, they're mm-hmm. almost all using non-traditional TV devices for the majority of their video consumption. So it's a very, so these are very different groups. And if you're trying to say, you know, what should I invest in or what should my policies be, whatever aspect of this you're coming at and you're trying to see what's, you know, where's this going? Mm -hmm. Um, And if you don't understand that there are at least these three different groups, you're bound to make a strategic error because Mm -hmm. each one of them is going to want to buy things differently in different formats and at at different times. You know, when when they're ready to do X or Y or Z is going to be different among the different groups. That's, I I think that's really interesting. That's the thing that I think I knew intuitively, and then reading your research, it became more and more clear to me. And Danny, I think you and I were having a conversation also about just the sheer numbers and something that Larry said um, struck me, and this is a question from my dad, is TV going away? Yeah, I mean, that's a, it it is a really interesting question and it, it, you have to think about how we define these terms, and I apologize for not defining some acronyms. No, I set you up for it, failure. It's, it, it was, I love it. I would expect nothing less. I know. Um, so I, 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 I agree with, with most of the conversation here. I just want to add a, a couple of little, little tiny distinctions, at, at least the way I think about this. And, and number one is that TV and streaming, and this may go without saying, are not fundamentally different media they are if you think about the content side let's let's dig into that for a second but but the main distinction is some different business models and some different distribution mechanisms and some different consumption habits and i i, I think that um one thing that's surprising in in our limited data we have you know not millions of users mm-hmm. but um is that 
there are there not subscribing to cable does not mean outside of the TV universe. We find that a lot of our younger users use credentials for TV everywhere <laughs> apps or for that you know to, for their HBO or whatever. So there are the 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 um, folks who are still subscribing to pay TV who are um, in the the kind of Gen X and above um, in your breakdown are, are actually kind of casting a halo down for some TV habits for the younger users. Are, I, I believe that linear and live and broadcast is is the is a set of habits and a set of a distribution model, but I don't necessarily agree that um, users, including young users, see a difference in content between TV and streaming. They see a difference in content based on the content, the types of content. So um, uh, FX premium shows that are consumed via soon Hulu are viewed just the same as premium shows from Disney Plus in my mind. And I think those distinctions are going away. I also just on this point of TV versus streaming or are they going away? Um, I do think there still is a place for live. I think uh, the legacy networks and programmers have been spending a lot of time on this for decades or years at least. We've been talking about the importance of sports, maybe news, other live events. Um, and I think you've seen something that we wouldn't have imagined seven years ago or something, that the live musical is now a thing. Um, so I really do think it's inevitable that most of the major streaming platforms will get into some kind of live component. Um, and, and one distinction you're seeing now that's, you know, I, this is too strong of a word, but sort of controversial in this, in this world this of analysts and whatnot is the weekly distribution mm. uh, uh, release pattern. So Disney Plus and Apple TV Plus and HBO Max presumably will be mostly releasing or at least releasing a healthy number of their shows on a weekly, you know, uh, cadence. And there are many people who believe, no, streaming is binging. You know, if, yeah. if you just, just follow Rick Greenfield for like a day and you'll see, <laughs> um, you'll see that point. So I think that that's, um, I actually expect to see a lot of convergence in the habits. Um, I think Add the the one place where I think these kinds of questions align with the content side is I do not believe that I believe that younger generations in particular, but also older generations have have a set of habits uh, that are distinct to different types of content. And mm -hmm. I don't think ad supported and free will ever be the dominant model for premium content, maybe mm -hmm. weekly, but so I, I differ slightly there. I think what we see happening is VMVPDs, virtual MVPDs, as you mentioned, are the main difference in our view. You're right. They were no innovation or no different, except that they're heavily subsidized. So they're affordable. So they're 40, 50, $60. The prices are starting to go up. YouTube TV, which I believe is the most popular now or by numbers, loses $9 per sub per month because they're, you know, subsidizing their, uh, the fees. So those will become $70 packages, $60 packages. They will be smaller than, you know, your cable package. But I do think those economics are, are kind of critical I, um, on that side because I don't think the VMVPDs, I think, to your point, are essentially a different delivery mechanism, and that's it. Uh, thanks for... Thanks for cleaning up my mess, Danny. And um, I think this is an interesting uh, discussion about types of content and, and distribution and sourcing. And so what I might do is ask Kanan to talk about the industry generally and then um, Deshana to talk about, and not give us any secrets, but to talk about how you source for Quelly. So. So probably, I mean, in terms of content, if you think about the scale of spending, it's pretty unprecedented right now. I mean... We're looking at 600 shows, originals being made every year now, right? That number, you know, in the broadcast days before Netflix started making originals was less than half. And those. they're all great. Exactly. They're I mean, they are. Are, they, are you billing us a dollar? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> they better be. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's an enormous amount of volume, mm -hmm. right? And obviously it comes with a cost. I mean, Netflix spends $20 billion a year mm -hmm. um, right? or get, is getting there. I mean, last year they spent 15 and that number keeps going up. 
I um, looked that up last night, and it's big. It's bigger than the GDP of seventy countries. Wow! So yeah, that's it is an enormous just for scale. But see, the one thing that you know, if you think about that scale of spending, um, and put that into context, what is actually going on is slightly different than what the headline perception <laughs> is, because Netflix is the first global media company in many ways. Because if you think about it, Disney doesn't have TV channels all around the world. They only have it in the U.S. If you think of media companies in general, they are, for the most part, a local business. Mm-hmm. You don't have a European TV company essentially having a big presence in the U.S. Right? So when you think about television as a business, it's always been local. <laughs> for the first time, it's becoming global, which is why when you look at the scale of spending and why Netflix is spending the kind of money they are, it's a very different reason. When they make a show like The Witcher or Stranger Things, they can take that show and put it in 170 countries. No other company can do that, right? So mm-hmm. what that does is an average broadcast show historically used to cost roughly $2 million an episode, 2 to $3 million an episode. <coughs> Today, if you think about The Mandalorian on Disney+, Plus, it costs them somewhere between 20 to $25 million an episode. Mm. That's the, and now when you spend that $20 million, you're not really going after the U.S. market. What you're actually doing is you're going across a base of 500 million subscribers that you could never access. That's really why your spending is going up. So when you think about the scale of spending, it's gone up. The number of shows have gone up. But the the reason why it's gone up is very different. And the economics behind that are very different than, (coughs) sorry, what it used to be in the Mm -hmm, past. mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, I mean, the one area I would differentiate, (coughs) sorry, is sports. I mean, that's the one uh, kind, I mean, one vertical for content, which for the most part is still local, for the most part. I mean, when you think about, you know, soccer, it's global and cricket is global. But outside of that, most sports tend to be local. Hmm. Now, the reason why that's important is because when you think about the scale of spending on sports in different parts of the world, it is extremely skewed. Mm -hmm. The U.S. accounts for 7% of all the homes in the world but 50% of all the spending on content. Wow. And the biggest reason for that is sports. Right? If you look at Disney and Fox um, off balance sheet, when you look at the amount of money they've committed to pay the NFL and you know, all the other sports leagues, it's $100 billion. That's what they've committed to pay for sports for multiple years to come. <coughs> right? So when you think about the biggest driver of content cost growth, it's actually sports. Right? And that's not going to change. Um, going forward. So when you think about content in general, I think it has to be thought about in these two broad buckets Mm -hmm. and the dynamics behind these two are very different compared to, you know, um, anything else we've seen in the past. And within sports, I mean, it is predominantly football in the U.S. It's NFL. Mm -hmm. If you look Mm -hmm. at, you know, sort of 19 of the 20 most uh, highest viewership live shows, it's sports. And most of those, I think 10 of the 19 are NFL games. Mm. That's right. Interesting. Um, Deshaun, I do want to kind of take from the global view down to the, the you're ascend, I mean, you're a one woman programmer and, and entrepreneur, et cetera. And I mean, you're not a one woman show, but um, how almost, how do you, how do you approach sourcing of content and, um, and thinking about your audience? And, and even if you want to talk about the process, I think that would be really interesting to folks. Um, it's interesting to me. So might be interesting to some of these people. So when I first started the company, my background was in journalism. I didn't know anything about streaming or content. I assumed that you ask for a film and you can just plop it up anywhere. That's not the case. There's different territories have licensing agreements. You can only show it in one place and another. So if you're in the U.S., you want to watch one film and you can't because maybe someone in Brazil has rights to it or you want to watch it. CBS has the rights to a film. The USA has to wait for it to get... I didn't know any, any of this stuff when I started Clay TV. And so I created my model in a way, kind of like where Netflix, where I get worldwide rights. 90% of my films you can watch anywhere in the world. I, some films we can't because they have license agreements in other places. But like in Netflix, I want to have a global perspective. I, want, I see my audience being global. I think that is the future. I think, you know, everyone is going to have streaming here in the U.S., but for, in order for companies to grow, you really need to look on a global scale. And I'm doing it on a very smaller level because we're, we're not Netflix yet. 
And so initially when I started my company, just to be quite honest, because I am a journalist and I don't have a lot of resources, I literally just would go to film festivals. We get our films from film festivals and I would email people from film festivals and say, hey, I saw your film and it's really good. Can it be on my platform? I had this new company. And when we launched our beta, we had 30 filmmakers on the platform without, <laughs> they didn't know me from Adam, but they <laughs> knew that if it weren't for us, there is no other space to watch their film. Yeah. I think with the streaming wars that we're talking about, they're all fighting for the same content. They mm-hmm. want Ted, the movie, they want all the, 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 I don't know, the sci-fi movies that I don't, right. You don't talking. know because you, you have been too busy. <laughs> so I, I, I know. I'll my go. husband knows them and he tells me about <laughs> them and I'm watching as I'm like looking and typing at the same time, kind of <laughs> looking a little bit, you know, Avengers. Oh no, he died. I'm so sad. But I don't really get a chance to... <laughs> and he came back. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so um, they're fighting for that same content. Mm-hmm. Netflix started creating original programming pretty much out of necessity, right? Yeah. The studios were increasing the prices for their content. And so what they do, call their bluff. We're going to make our own. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they've been very successful at it. We'll see what happens with their debt, though. I mean, it's my, <laughs> it's my big concern. Yeah. Anybody from now? Okay. <laughs> well, you do know Netflix is in a huge amount of debt. And with Disney+, Plus, I'm actually concerned about how they're going to be able to keep up with it. And so for our business model, um, 60% of our revenue goes to our, our content creators. Creators. Mm-hmm. We pay them based off of minutes view. So we don't pay for a lot of content up front. That's another thing I learned from Netflix where we don't have $20 billion to create Stranger Things or whatever. We only have our resources because we're pretty much, not to say totally bootstrap, we haven't raised a lot of money. And so we want to preserve our money as much as possible. And so I think for the future, there, is, there will be a lot of money going to spending on content, but I think over time, that's, it's going to, I think in the next five years, it's going to be cut in half mm-hmm. because there are some players who won't make it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think Apple Plus, I think it's, a, it's, I think it's great, but will they make it? I mean, that's, I don't, I don't know. And so for me, for us to make it, we're, we're making sure that we're sourced international content so we can reach people around the world and then growing at a, at a slower space, at a, at a slower scale than maybe a Netflix can do. So hopefully I answered your question. Okay. No, it did. I, I, I think I've heard you talk about the film festival circuit in the past. Mm-hmm. And I think um, it, the, your background as a journalist kind of looking around right, right. How, how folks mm-hmm. have done it, um, it, it sounds like have set you up as a, an entrepreneur very right. well. And, and honestly, because we're not fighting for all those top films, and Netflix and Apple Plus, whatever, they're not looking for them. You know, our independent films that did really well at Sundance, whatever. Mm-hmm. Apple and Netflix are not looking for them unless some big name was a part of it. Where do those films go? Especially if, especially if it's a black mm-hmm. filmmaker. Mm-hmm. It goes to us. I meet with distributors. They like get, take all of it. Just you know, <laughs> seriously, yeah, yeah, because yeah. no one's asking for it. You know, and I think they're all. I mean, people think there's one consumer. We all want to watch the same thing. We don't. We see ourselves as a supplement. You yeah. know, I think that's the future. You're gonna have everyone's gonna have a Netflix or or Apple or you know HBO Max, and then you're gonna have some supplements. If you're into horror, you're gonna have your horror streaming. If you're into romantic comedy, you're going to have this romantic, whatever your thing is, you're going to have one to it of your thing in addition to the big, you know, company. I think you bring up a great point about consumers, right? The, um, I mean, I said a lot of this in jest that take my money. I'm, I sign up for everything. I'm very excited. I want to see all, because I'm a voracious consumer. I love talking about it. But, um, you know, Deshana, you started a company with a, with a consumer in mind, that mm-hmm. um, the consumer you are, and this expansive view, Danny, I think you probably have have views on consumers. Everybody does. I'd really these changes have been good for consumers, bad for consumers, mixed bag. Are we? None of us are going to get sleep because we're just streaming twenty four seven. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, and it's something I think about a lot, and um, we've talked about. I think. I, I mentioned briefly kind of how this uh, business came about for me. And the main driver was looking at, you know, thinking through how things were, where things were heading specifically, you know, when, when we were looking at the Comcast NBCU transaction, there was a lot of deep thinking about like what's going to happen in the next seven years <laughs> or whatever. Um, and, and what are the things we need to protect against? And I think, 
it, the I think can, the while in many ways we're much better off. Um, and the main thing I think that I see, because there has been starting now recently in the past six months or so, as we've gotten Apple TV Plus, HBO Max, and Peacock, we're hearing about all these. Um, people are starting to say, "Oh, great, we're going back to the cable, you know, bundle. I'm going to have." $85 if I subscribe to these, whatever. And the pushback on that, mostly from actual users and younger folks, is no, I can cancel anytime I want. It's I'm paying only for what I want. And there is, I believe, a, a great, a, some satisfaction in that. I mm. do believe this is just a, a thought exercise, not an actual data point, that um, for many people, uh, one of the things we do, we have a little quiz that lets you, you say where you live and what you care about. And we look at the price of standalone broadband as compared to a double play. And, um, and the fact is for many people, if you could, if you say to them, you know, if you pay $10 more, Mm -hmm. you're getting twice the channels, you'll have all that, you know, it's a much better deal. It's, there is something more satisfying about paying that $5 left if less, if it's going to the places that you, you you know, if you don't feel like you're paying for stuff that you don't care about. Mm -hmm. Um, However, those costs really do add up. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally believe that the, one of the biggest dangers here or, or kind of landmines lurking out there is complexity in broadband pricing, um, complexity with new partnerships and bundles of two or three services. So what if your Verizon comes with Disney Plus and your Spotify comes with Hulu and your, you know, DirecTV mm-hmm. Now comes with HBO Max and um, and furthermore, and this is something I won't go into now, but it's something we feel very strongly about. There's a whole other middleman that we are not that we haven't we're not used to looking at, which mm-hmm. is a distribution platform like Apple's App Store, Amazon Channels. Um, increasingly, if you subscribe to DirecTV now, I'm actually, just as a quick aside, convinced that Apple TV Plus is actually about the services revenue for other subscriptions being the hub than being the one, you know, um, one must have service. So that, and, and I, I want to, can I make one point about the global You've and the got content the mic. stuff? You've got the mic, Danny, go. Okay. Um, you know, first of all, on, on thinking about Netflix as the first global media company, that's absolutely true in the sense that it's the first global, um, I guess you could call it direct-to-consumer or vertically integrated media company. But it is the case that Disney and Warner Brothers, my former employer, um, distributed globally for many, many, many years and in a way, a business model that was significantly more profitable than the direct-to-consumer model. So Mm -hmm. Netflix with 167 million, whatever, something like that, global subscribers, you know, the ARPU, the the revenue from each user in India, in even in Brazil, or, you know, is, is significantly lower than here. Well, when Disney makes a movie, or this, and this is different with Disney Plus, but let's say three years ago, when Warner Brothers made a movie or a TV series, we kept all the rights. We sold it to U.S. broadcast networks. We sold it to streaming services. Then we sold it to a broadcast network in every country. And then we sold it to, and we put it in theaters and every, and then you get to sell DVDs. So windowing is actually a very lucrative business model. So I don't, I do see a very, very, very different ability to recoup costs on investment for someone like Netflix or someone like Apple, who, by the way, you know, 500 million users with their credit card is a lot better position to be in than 167 million who can cancel with a click. So we're going to, these companies are all starting to overlap, Mm -hmm. distributors and hardware makers or content uh, manufacturers. I actually think at the end of the day, a lot of these players in, on both sides are going to end up with the best of both worlds. Mm. Netflix is sort of an outlier, but I'm, I am actually not one of these people who thinks theaters are going to go away or windows are going to go away. You see even Amazon doing a more traditional model than a Netflix, say. So, so we're not, I don't think, looking at a total revolution and everything is direct-to-consumer distribution day and date worldwide because frankly, just shareholders will demand extracting as much value from the content, especially when you're 
you have whatever, however billion dollars in debt that needs to be recouped. That's an interest. I mean, it's interesting as we as consumers think about the next decade, right? Yeah. And then as as people making policy think about the next decade and and where the puck is going, so to speak. So I, I do want to give everybody else a chance to opine if they'd like to, but I want to prepare you, dear audience, um, for your questions. So if you have anything that you would like to ask, um, a question, please. And then and then um, we'll go to Angie first because I saw her hand first. But did anybody want to follow up? On the consumer point? No, but we do have to talk about policy. <laughs> uh, Angie, are you going to ask him a policy I question? I was going to get back I don't to the micro question. Yeah. That you were raising, Danny. Because it does seem like we have quite a few streamers at this point who are developing and producing their own content, keep it exclusive as a means to Absolutely. get people to subscribe to yeah. their streaming service, right? Which is a really smart way to get your subscribership base to increase over time. Mm-hmm. When do you think the tipping point's going to be for Netflix and others to kind of realize that there's still a market out there, that if they're willing to sell yeah. that programming to others, um, it's a really do you hard. see that happening? And do you think it's likely? I, 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 well, so right now, I believe Netflix... Wait, Danny, has, can I ask you for the yeah. streamers? Oh. Um, can I ask for the streamers? Can I ask you to... Repeat the repeat, question. Yes. yes, repeat Angie's question. We'll get, yes. a que- we'll get a mic for questions. Okay, great. Uh, so the question was about the growth of exclusivity as a way of keeping subscribers or getting new subscribers. Um, and do we see that changing or evolving? Um, on the one hand, no. Exclusivity is, I think, going to be the main driver of user acquisition and retention. However, you do see right now Netflix is considering... I believe, I, I think maybe, or maybe they already made this deal to syndicate Grace and Frankie and some of their other shows, but kind of once they've reached a place and that's on broadcast TV, which they don't think will really cannibalize. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, the, the, the best way of explaining, I think, or, or hitting home the exclusivity problem is that uh, in the most recent, or maybe it was 2018, this internet kind of back-end company, Sandvine, does a global state of the internet or, or uh, internet phenomena report. And they had a whole analysis of the fact that content piracy has gone after years of going down back up. And, it's, uh, and they basically attribute that to these silos of exclusive, you know, programming. And, this, this, and it's something we're very focused on. It has become... Remarkably, harder and harder to find what you want to watch um, than it was, you know, a couple of years ago. Now there's still a big contingent, and I this still blows my mind. Who go right to Netflix to find what they want to watch, and if it's not there, it's not there. Um, but so I, I'm not, sure, and I'm curious if you have thoughts on this. I mean, I really do think exclusivity is here to say, and not great for consumers. It creates a lot of complexity. Um, and if you're focused on subscriber growth and retention, which I assume will be the main scrutinized things in earnings for all of these companies in the coming years, um, exclusivity is crucial. And things like people's, you know, people like to be able to binge. Um, once you start focusing on ARPU, but, or not ARPU actually, but actually looking at content investment and how you're, you know, kind of monetizing it. Yeah, windows are a very windows and kind of carving out rights are a very um, a very good way to you know maximize profit. Yeah, yeah that, you know exclusivity is it's really a double edged sword in this industry because a hundred percent of your cost is production. It costs you nothing to distribute, uh, and the, you know the t- the twenty millionth consumer watching your show costs you nothing relative to the hundred millionth right. consumer. So if you if you're spending all that money on production and you're limiting your audience, you're saying, you know, I could get, and, and as you say, the, the way to manage that is to think about uh, how I can, can distribute broadly, but still maintain exclusivity. And part of that is timing. Right. Um, and, and part of that is, you know, sort of regional as well. But if, you, if, if, you're, if your model is going to be 100% exclusive, um, you're leaving, you know, and you, you're, you know you're leaving a lot of money on the table. Well, in the way, this is the bold, the bold thesis on Netflix, which no one says, but I have to say, because it's true of Uber and others, is the only way other metric to increase that return on investment 
is to raise prices. If, if the goal is to keep subscribers and monetize from your subscribers, you know, if you're up at $20 a month, then you are making more money on that. Yeah, so at, at whatever, $4.99, $6.99 for, for Disney Plus, um, I mean, the way I always think about it is like when I get my Blue Apron box, I open it up and I imagine there's a $20 bill in there from some venture capitalist because right. there's no way, <laughs> there's no way that that's, that's cost effective. And it's the same thing at $4.99 or $6.99 for Disney Plus. You know, every time you watch The Mandalorian, you know, Mickey Mouse is handing you a $10 bill as well because there's... Right, but you're also going maybe to a park and to a... They have other ways of... Yeah, and, and if they don't... But if they don't... If they, if they can't... If they can't, uh, uh, you know, maximize the, the revenue from that content, then it's, a, it's definitely a money-losing proposition. Uh, certainly now it's a money-losing proposition. And, you know, Disney has a lot of money, but Apple has more cash than the market cap of Disney. Um, so if you're thinking, you know, who's, who's, you know, who's the 100,000-pound gorilla standing here, it's, it's Apple. For sure. They can outlast, it, it, to your point, you know, who's, who's going to fold first? Sony already closed uh, PlayStation View. In ter- if you're thinking about who can afford to keep pouring money into content without making it back initially from the content, uh, Apple, <laughs> Apple stands head and shoulders here. I completely agree. Okay, we have, I've seen two hands, and I don't know that we have a mic that I can run. Oh, this is embarrassing. Can I, oh, here comes Emma. This is my colleague, Emma Christman. She's amazing also. Thank you. All right, two quick questions. Um, the way I've heard several of you describe it, there's basically a generational divide in these, uh, according to the phases of development, if you will. Um, how are these big studios, media companies, production houses allocating budget according to content creation and the generational divide? My second question, how can small companies, whether they're considered niche or not, that are producing content compete against these larger houses, um, as well as against the self-made YouTube generation. Yeah, I guess, um, oh, there's one more. Oh, no, I, okay. answer her, sorry. You guys answer her question, and then he'll go next. Okay. I apologize. No problem. No, so in terms of the content budgets, if you think about you know, uh, the differences between different streaming services. HBO Max has basically come out and said half their content is going to be focused on teenagers. Um, and uh, if you think about Netflix, Netflix looks like a traditional broadcast network. You have shows for kids, shows for women, shows for men, you know. It has shows for every single demographic. Um, if you look at Peacock from Comcast, it's more focused on comedy because, you know, they have Saturday Night Live for the last few decades. They have The Office and so on and so forth. It's a lot more comedy uh, focused. Right? So when you think about it, what's really happening here is people are picking. Anybody who's not Netflix has to pick a spot. Disney is picking essentially family content. That's what Disney Plus is. Or they are picking sports, which is what ESPN Plus is. Right? And Peacock is picking its spot and so on. Netflix, therefore, becomes the traditional broadcast network. And everybody else becomes the traditional cable network. The question now is who bundles all this together and comes to the you know, consumer and aggregates this on one screen. Right? So that's basically where the process is going. But in terms of content budgets, that's how different companies are allocating their budgets to figure out what kind of content they want to make. Right? I think the, the, the concern... Um, if you're sort of t- talking at the, at the executive suite, is, is not so much how to allocate the budget, but how to, to minimize, um, to, to Danny's point, how to minimize cannibalization. So uh, this may not be in it anymore, but when Sling TV first launched a couple of years ago, uh, I, I spoke to the, the folks uh, involved. They won the best of show at CES that year. And they told me that, you know, they have, in the original bundle, they had some Disney channels. Um, I think some ESPN w- was in there. Mm-hmm. Um, their relationship with Disney was such that the contract said if Sling TV signed up too many people, <laughs> Disney had the right to pull out, right? <laughs> and that, and which makes complete business sense. What they're okay. saying is we want a service that will sell at a cheaper price to consumers that we otherwise weren't getting anyway, anyway that they weren't going to buy a linear programming package. 
So any money is better than no money. But if our linear legacy progress customers switch over and say, oh, well, I like that's a better price, I'm going to switch over to Sling, then we're leaving the service. Um, and as I say, it makes, it makes total business. But trying to balance exclusivity with cannibalization, with maximizing revenue from intellectual property, it's, it's remarkably delicate. Um, and nobody's got it right because nobody knows what the audience wants or even how many audiences there are. And so everybody's making mistakes, which is perfectly normal in a period of, of great disruption. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see who makes the fewest mistakes. That's probably you know, <laughs> going to be the indicator of success. Isn't that always the case? Yeah. yeah. So I can't really speak on budgets because I don't have a big budget. So <laughs> Mike, can I talk about your second question was around smaller um, companies trying to compete for original programming only? Is that where you're like creating content? I guess, or, yeah. Oh, was, I wonder, so was that what you said? That is it, right? Okay. So we're not creating content right now. Um, and that's on purpose because we don't have a big budget to be able to create the type of content based off of people's appetites. So to me, there's like two levels, right? There's like the Netflix big production that people expect. And then there's like the YouTube, someone with the camera, this one to be on a TikTok or something, right? That's like, to me, that's it. I mean, there's a little bit of medium, but either people expect to be really, really bad, like, okay, we know we're going to watch this for free on YouTube or TikTok for a couple of seconds, or it's going to be really, really good. And the problem is that, like, for us, because our site and we look like a big company, people assume that we can spend money to make a Netflix film. We have filmmakers say, why don't you, how come you're not making original programming yet? I mean, that's how Netflix... Netflix spends billions of dollars on one episode. <laughs> we don't have the resources to do that, but it's not impossible, right? So we have filmmakers who create shorts. They may spend $100,000, and it makes it to Sundance or American Black Film Festival, or whatever. It, it does well. Um, but I think that the reality is that people have a certain expectation for content, the way it should look if it's going to be on a streaming service. And so... If you are looking to create original programming, a lot of my filmmakers start with maybe web shows, um, starting out on like a YouTube to test the water. It's kind of like what Issa Rae did, right? She started out on YouTube. She created these shows. The budget wasn't that great, but she wanted to at least kind of get what she wanted to produce out there to see whether there was a market for it, where people loved it. And then she was able to move on to like HBO where she has to pre- the production budget to be able to create more. And so that would be my advice is to just start small, um, but it but the expectation from consumers is they want, they want the big production. So that's why we're not doing it. I'm not going to create a, an original show unless we have the, the budget to be able to make it look good. Because we will get emails. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want those emails. But, you know, but, but this is a really good reminder of kind of the promise of all of this. There's Sometimes it's discouraging when we talk about, you know, kind of, I mean, Netflix as the new broadcast network makes perfect sense. But what's global content for Netflix is probably more like an Adam Sandler movie or a Michael Bay movie than the global content yeah. you're talking about that that has great potential to kind of build communities, but also hopefully they uh, uh, kind of fill this gap that has been missing in Hollywood for years. There have been times when we've been better with with smaller studios that do you know two million dollar movies that has mostly disappeared. Um, and what counts as an indie movie for Amazon is not really. But if this kind of middle segment can thrive, not the great tools like YouTube that have empowered people, but to get to be able to reach a sustainable model for funding those kind of smaller but require real money projects and getting them out to the right communities, that's that's the the. Good news here. I mean, I think. Interesting. So, sir, you get the last word. Ellen, I have a question. Do- yes, Larry. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are the policy implications here? Larry, I don't know. I'm not empowered to have, answer that question, but you sure can. Plus, I only know enough to be dangerous, so tell me. Well, I do. I, I, I mean, because I do. Seriously, I want to take a couple minutes yeah. just to... to okay, you this have... This is a policy conference. You have three, three minutes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that, that happens in every disruptive... Uh, industry disruption that, that I've looked at over the last 30 years is invariably 
policy and law lag. Um, that's not a fault of any individual or any party. It's just the reality. Um, and the, sort of the fly in the ointment here is while sort of it's, it's you know, open season globally, as we've talked about for streaming services, for the traditional uh, producers, content producers, for networks, for affiliates, and then for the MVPDs, um, we've got this sort of 40-year collection of regulations, some are statutory, some are FCC, some are other, some are copyright license, um, that nobody together, nobody would defend. Nobody thinks they make sense as a group. Everybody wants to kind of keep one or the other because it helps them. But, but together, and if you're not you know, familiar with this world, it's weird stuff. You know, so network non-duplication, retransmission consent, must carry compulsory license, program access rules, all of them together are sort of trying to figure out who can buy what content from whom and who can show what content where. And each and every one of them individually came about in response to an earlier disruptive technology. So a lot of them started with, the, with cable TV. Was the, that was the disruptor of broadcast. A lot of those rules came from there. Then satellite, which had a very different distribution model. Oh, well, that creates new problems. So then we got a new set of, of these rules. They're all kind of hanging around. They're all causing a lot of mischief. It's, may, I think, one of the main reasons that a lot of MVPDs have moved into the business of owning their own content, because mm-hmm. that's how they can now get into the streaming world uh, on a sort of level playing field. But, in, you know, that's not necessarily the right solution, right? The right solution is clear the decks. And there have been efforts over the last 10 years, uh, Senator DeMint and then Congressman Scalise, uh, and even it came up a little bit in the discussions about renewal of the, of the satellite bill of Stellar, is can we just clear the boards, get rid of all this garbage, uh, all, the, all, this, uh, all this debris, and keep everybody on, on the level playing field, or just keep the regulations that still make sense in light of the technological the developments that, that have happened? No progress is the, is the short answer. The FCC has kind of relaxed some of them, but then the courts reinstated some of them. So uh, we're really looking at this, at this sort of crazy world where if you're, if you're a traditional linear programmer, you li- I got a list here, and I have a presentation. They wouldn't let me put it up. So if you want it, I'm happy to send it to you. It's not it censorship. I couldn't just, figure no, out how to IT, do it. Yeah. But, um, you know, I these sort of, that noted for the record. These are two dozen major, major uh, either rules or, or regs or, or statutes. That, that limit in kind of bizarre and, and no longer rational ways what the linear folks can do. One of the reasons that their linear is going away and everybody is moving as quick as they can to streaming is to get away from this. As I say, that's not the solution. By the way, the other thing, the last thing I'll say, the other thing that's not the solution is to turn it the other way. Mm. So 2014, were you guys at the FCC 2014? No, long gone. Okay. Uh, two years gone. Okay, so <laughs> then I can say FCC, FCC docket number 14-261, which is still open. Uh, last time I checked, uh, came after the Aereo uh, the debacle yeah, yeah, at the Supreme yeah. Court. That, uh, that, that proceeding would have applied to streaming or some streaming services. All 24 of that list of MVPD rules that I mentioned, exactly the wrong solution. The proceeding didn't go anywhere. They did, the FCC didn't act on it, but the docket's still open, so they've left open the, uh, the possibility. That's clearly not the, the, the solution. Okay, now shut up. Well, it's not the first panel I've lost control of, but it is the most fun so far. Um, and we are at 12.01, so I want to be mindful. Don't we get to go to 12.15? Do we? According to this. <laughs> <laughs> I think we still have an audience. I mean, you guys can yeah. Yeah, you we can to 12.15. Can I add one? Yeah. He had a question. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, guys, keep It's mayhem. <laughs> I love it. Go. Sure. Just picking up on Daniel's point earlier, there is a competitor out there that's disrupting uh, both your kind of services and your kind of services, and that's the criminal network that uh, that run uh, pirate operations uh, using both linear uh, and video on demand, and they're not limited to U.S. content or anything else, and they can undercut the prices of both Comcast and some of the smaller services by not paying programmers and just taking the content. Um, and we're talking about policy here, so how do you see uh, the policy of the United States, and hopefully the Department of Justice is listening, but how do you see the policy of the United States in terms of combating some of that online piracy that's really uh, a, a major competitor now with, uh, with all these legitimate services? So one of the problems actually with piracy, it's more than policy, it's technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People just share passwords, um, right? And there are cable companies who are 
up in arms against this. I mean, one of the big focus areas right now for cable companies like Charter, for example, their CEO has mentioned this consistently for the last one year, um, is, you know, when you have licenses uh, that Disney offers to, say, YouTube for their bundle versus the same license for somebody like a Charter or a Comcast, Comcast and Charter have a set-top box to control how many people view ESPN at a given point in time. And if multiple rooms have multiple streams of ESPN on traditional TV, you need multiple set-top boxes. That doesn't work in a streaming environment, right? And so the constraint here, more than policy, is actually technology. Um, and there isn't an easy solution to this, uh, but it is something that a lot of people are focused on right now. Uh, and Netflix deals with this in some ways because... You know, they do have local rights for different shows. And, you know, they have different rights in the UK versus the US, for example, for certain shows. But people get around that as well mm -hmm. through, you know, proxy servers and so on and so forth. Now, in some instances, companies actually want this. Yeah. Right. And that's the other problem, which is the incentives are not aligned. Because Netflix wants people to taste their content for free, even if you're pirating that content. And once you're hooked on to Netflix, then you might pay for it in the future mm -hmm. at some point in time. Right? So the thing is, today you have a lot of other constraints other than policy. Even if policy was in place, I think the incentives are not fully aligned. At least, you know, that's the way we see it. Yeah. And, uh, I, go, go ahead. No, no. But, no I, look at, well then, go ahead. <laughs> I, I just want to add very quickly, I, 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 I agree for the most part, and I don't think, I, th I think for the past, let's say, decade or two, Actually, the, the onus was mostly on content companies. I mean, when I, I was at Warner Brothers for four years and saw anti-piracy go from an enormous priority group to kind of less and less important because in some ways we, we, we won the, the battle on rampant piracy. The main lever we realized, which was not the lever any of the content companies took, is just make it easy for people to get your content at a reasonable fee. And so when Hollywood gave up on ownership and ultraviolet, trying to get people to buy digital copies and are moving to streaming subscriptions, uh, all you can eat, that, that will help. Um, I think I have a slightly different take on the password sharing. I completely agree that most companies that are suffering from password sharing are knowingly allowing it. And most companies... Uh, most of those companies have plans and the technical ability to crack down on password sharing when, if and when it is time. So I don't think that's so much the, tech, the technology issue. They want to bring those folks into the fold. And to your point, they don't, they don't care right now. Um, but, I, but I do think that increasingly the user experience issue, which was the solution in the first round of piracy, here is going to be fragmentation, exclusivity, um, that's where the difficulty, it's not anymore the business model. We're going to make you buy this for $15, so that's your incentive to go. Yeah, I mean, pi so piracy, and this, this is going to sound very bad, but piracy isn't really a problem. And again, in an industry where 100% of your costs are production, if the pirates are people who weren't going to buy your service anyway, right. um, and maybe, in fact, it's the taste test uh, is what they're really doing, um, then from a business standpoint, from an economic standpoint, you're not losing. Now, as it starts to eat into uh, people who otherwise would have subscribed, that's when, that's when you've got a problem. And I'm not suggesting we're only down here, that, of course, you know, it's a, a whole range. But if, if you could limit piracy to people who literally can't afford or weren't, weren't going to pay anyway, uh, you would say it's not worth enforcing. Um, if there is worth enforcing, yeah, I, I agree. The solution, the problem is technical, but the solution is also technical. You're never going to be able to, especially with extrajudicial, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the sort of wholesale piracy outside the United States, outside of uh, even the WTO, um, you, you're not going to enforce it legally anyway. And if you could, it would take 10,000 years and they'd just move somewhere else. So the, the technical solutions to it are, are the only hope to the extent that, you know, you do have a business problem, which I'm saying you, you do. It's just not 100%. Sorry. That was no. That was a great. You don't have to apologize, Larry. Well, um, I think I shouldn't be allowed caffeine. In the <laughs> I, d I do just want to say I did not censor you. I just couldn't figure it out. Um, so I just got the high sign from Tim that we maybe have time for one last quick, brief round of comments. Is there anything, folks, you want folks to leave with that they 
they didn't get? Is well, I guess, no, please. From a policy perspective, I guess the one thing to keep in mind is uh, uh, the way consumers consume streaming, you know, is on Netflix or any of these products. But the way it is going to be sold to consumers is going to change, hmm. which I think raises a lot of policy questions, which are still very early. So, for example, I think the core way video will be sold will be on the back of services which are non-video. And what I mean by that is Comcast is going to bundle Peacock with broadband. Verizon may do it with wireless. Amazon may do it with Prime. Apple may do it with a phone. So the question is, if video is bundled with something that is not video, how do you regulate it? Right? If it is given away uh, as an attachment to a service which can be anything, literally. And that's why convergence as, a, you know, as an overall theme in video, it's an anchor to sell something. Now, what that something is may not be video. And that's where I think a lot of policy issues in the future might come up, um, you know, and therefore how you regulate wireless, broadband, video, Apple, Amazon. And, and there are obviously FCC looks at some issues and FTC looks at some issues and so on. These areas will all converge at some point. And I think those are the bigger policy questions that, you know, we might face at some point in the future. And I'll just throw in two very quick specific examples of that, things to think about. In the policy world, the thing I'm most paying attention to in the next 10 years is uh, zero rating. I think and, and I'm using that loosely to describe a set of issues around net neutrality. And um, this, this question of layers that do the same thing but are in completely different, you know, the, the, the broadcast rooted in old broadcast regulations, rooted in cable regulations. Think about the equivalent of a um, carriage dispute between Apple, mm -hmm. who has 500 million, or let's say 200, 100 million U.S. subscribers and arguably a great deal of market power blocking the Amazon Prime app, the ESPN Now app. Um, I, as far as I can tell, there's no current besides a broad antitrust review at the FC, FTC. So, so we need to look at the fact that the FCC has these very specific tools for very specific problems that are going to be the exact same problems, essentially, or analogous in a totally different industry. But it, it is still the kind of, net, not the network layer, but the platform layer, the applications layer. So I think we're going to have to think a lot more broadly about that. Um, just real briefly, we've mostly been talking about produced content. But I, I just want to say that, that, you know, there's a fascinating ecosystem that's growing up for, for the, the, the economics of self-produced content. Right. So I'm looking a lot at, at, at YouTube stars or even sort of mid-level YouTube stars. Mm -hmm. How do they make their, their money? You know, it's not just the, obviously, they get advertising. And that's, a, I think, a small part of it. They, get, they can now get sponsorships. There's things like Patreon where people can effectively pay them to keep producing their content. They get book deals and so on and so forth. And that has been really evolving extremely quickly just in the three or four years that I first started looking at it. I've been watching a couple of checking in with a couple of YouTube stars saying, OK, where are you making your money now? You know, where are you making your money now? And you, now you're up to five million. And um, it, it really, you know, and again, a lot of their content, it's amateur content. But, you know, they have 20, 30 million subscribers. So we're not talking minor stuff. Yeah. Um, it's a real source of disruption that we didn't really talk about. So I just wanted to underscore it. No, that's fascinating. And then Deshana, last word. <laughs> wow. Fourth and stream, download. <laughs> Besides yeah, yeah. download. Pitch. <laughs> I, well, I did pitch quite a bit. Yeah, def definitely um, download. But to me, based off of this conversation, none of us really know where the future is headed. I, you know, I, no one really knows. Apple, I keep calling it Apple Plus, but I think it's Apple TV Plus. Everyone's creating their own network, right? Because they're trying to figure out how can they be successful as I. And I call this the Wild Wild West, really. Um, in the next five years, there will be some players that will kind of taper off and there will be ones who are successful. And we're all just trying to navigate to see which way is the best way to um, get our content out there and, and make money. But I think for, as a, as a black person, a panel person of color, um, the conversations that are happening in our community is making sure that our content is being at the forefront. A lot of times, a lot of these companies, they understand the power. Like Google had recently uh, released this um, video of the most, the most like Google like celebrities and artists, and they're all black people. 
right? There, there's a lot of power in our, in our content. And for me, it's all about ownership. Right. And mm-hmm. that's something we're not really seeing on the bigger scale. We're talking about these, these big players. We don't really see a lot of people of color owning, that, yeah. owning their own our content. And so I think that's something else we should be thinking about when you talk about policy and yeah. making sure it's more inclusive. Absolutely. So I want to end with that. Thank <laughs> you. You're welcome. Thank you for with that. And please help me and thank our...